Okay, I've got my my screen up here for you. So yeah, my background um, is in all amphibians, but very heavily in salamanders. So I am the, the salamander sexpert, and I will be talking to you today um, about mostly the uh, physiology and anatomy of um, salamander reproduction, how it differ differentiates a bit from um, a urine uh, re reproduction and how that's important when you're looking at using um, assisted reproductive technologies. So um, to start, it's important to remember that salamanders are not frogs or caudates are not anurans. That is not something I'm saying to belittle you or you know, make you, you know, feel silly. It's a silly saying um, that one of my, my teachers in veterinary school used to say that cats are not dogs. And we always used to laugh, of course, cats are not dogs. Um, she used to say that to us to remind us that even animals that seem physiologically so similar um, have a lot of differences that you need to take into account when you're giving them uh, treatments and assisted reproductive technologies really are treatments. If we're using hormones on these animals, we are um, adapting their physiology, which brings me to my next point. I know you've you know, had a bit of background in this already in these webinars, but assisted reproductive technology is not magic. Um, we're not just giving hormones to these animals and magically making them uh, lay eggs or produce sperm. Or if we apply cryopreservation to sperm, it's not magically going to work on every single species. We are adjusting a concert of physiological cycles or physiological needs of these animals. And they may vary from species to species. So it's really important to understand the anatomy and the physiology of these animals before you start working with assisted reproductive technologies. And so that's what we're gonna talk a bit about today. So um, first I'll start with a very basic understanding of caudate reproduction, of the evolution of caudate reproduction. So here's a phylogenetic map of caudates. Uh, from the bottom, the most primitive, to the top, the most evolved. And of course, you all know primitive does not mean worse. In fact, in my opinion, it means the most successful. That means they've not had to change anything over time. But so at the bottom, we have cryptobronchids, and at the top, plethodons. And I'll show you some pictures in a minute if you're not as familiar with taxonomy. But the key to the, the basic differences across um, reproductive phylogeny is, is fertilization. There's a lot of other dis differences, but um, the, they've evolved to have different fertilization mechanisms. And the, the most uh, primitive animals are external fertilizers. So we have three families that undergo external fertilization. And those are the cryptobronchids or the giant salamanders, your hellbenders and giant salamanders, the hynobiids, which are your, your Asiatic salamanders, and then the sirens. Um, sirens have some other strange uh, reproductive adaptations that I'm not going to get into in any of these seminars, but um, for right now, we'll kind of lump these three together. And what you need to understand is these three families are external fertilizers. Now, most salamanders, the vast majority of them, are going to undergo internal fertilization. And we'll talk about how that works in all of them in a little bit. But your seven other families undergo internal fertilization for the most part. There's some, some other tweaks there that some of them can switch back and forth. But naturally, they all undergo internal fertilization. And that's your um, protodays, your uh, mud puppies, and your olms. Uh, salamander days, your true salamanders and newts, Dicamptonidae, uh, the Pacific giant salamanders, Ambistomatidae, mole salamanders, uh, the torrent salamanders, Amphiumas, and then Plethodons. And Plethodons, as the most evolved salamanders, they have a lot of interesting adaptations. They're lungless, and then they use a lot of pheromones in everything they do. And we'll talk about pheromones and how all the salamanders use them in reproduction in just a little while. 
So I'll go over a brief hormone axis review because I'm sure you will get sick of this throughout this seminar, but I'm sure we've already talked a bit about how um, gonadotropin releasing hormone or GNRH affects the pituitary. It comes from the brain, affects the pituitary to release luteinizing hormone or follicle stimulating hor hormone, LH or FSH. Those come down and act on the testicles and the ovaries to help produce sperm and eggs. Then when eggs and sperm are produced, that results in the production of testosterone and estrogen. And then that will feed back eventually and result in the decrease of GNRH. So the body is saying, we're already producing eggs, we're already producing sperm, we don't need to do it anymore. And so it's this natural feedback loop. Um, there's some other hormones on this that I'll point out. Dopamine. Um, dopamine during the brumation period or the hibernation period that increases and it, it puts a damper on this whole cycle. So it says you're sleeping, you don't need to produce eggs and sperm right now. So um, that, that kind of decreases the GNRH release. That is why sometimes when we give hormones, we'll talk about this in hormone um, protocols, you will give a, a dopamine antagonist in order to help increase this cycle. And then uh, prolactin and PGF2 alpha, these are two other hormones that are pretty important in salamander reproduction. They are important for pheromones, pheromone release, and for uh, egg letdown. Um, I do have HCG thrown on here. We won't talk a lot about that today, but that is a hormone we give um, artificially. It is a human chorionic gonadotropin that mimics luteinizing hormone and it helps produce sperm and egg. So that's a brief review of this. And um, let me get my little pointer back here. And so I'm not going to read this whole table for you. Uh, it is, it looks scary, but the point of this table is just to give you a reference moving forward. So these are the important hormones I just went over in um, salamander reproduction. So after this seminar, you can look back at this and it tells you what their primary functions are in male and female. And as we go through this uh, lecture today, I'll draw, come back to this table and highlight what I'm talking about. But again, I'm not gonna read it for you. It's nothing we're gonna dwell on today. So let's move forward and get into um, the, the kind of physiology of how reproduction in salamanders work. We'll start with sperm production because that was a lot of what I studied during my PhD is salamander sperm. So one of the first things I'm going to point out is um, there is a pretty big difference in how anurins produce sperm and in how salamanders produce sperm. So there are some salamanders that have very similar kidneys to frogs. Um, so all frogs have a, a testicle as shown here. And then down here, you'll see these little, um, ne they're nephrons, these little Pac-Man looking things. And then um, the yellow is urine being dumped out and the blue is sperm being dumped out. Um, the, the kidney and the testicle are more or less fused in a lot of frogs and then some salamanders like the, the more primitive salamanders and then some neotenic salamanders. And this, this fused testicle kidney, um, the sperm and the urine dump into one tubule. Now in frogs, that tends to happen at the same time. In salamanders, it tends to happen at different times. Uh, in most terrestrial salamanders, the testicle and the, the kidney looks a little bit different. So you still have in a lot of these animals what is called a genital kidney. So there's still a portion of the kidney that, that filters the sperm, but the tubes are completely separate. So the sperm is released completely separate from the urine and it, it should never touch. Now, um, genital kidneys are not always present in salamanders and they're in some of the most evolved in some of the plethodons, they don't have this portion down here that's shown in terrestrial salamanders, even though it's separate, they still have a genital kidney, but um, there are some salamanders that don't have that at all. Now my babbling on about this anatomy isn't important here. That's not, you know, the, the specifics of the anatomy isn't really what I'm trying to get across. What I'm trying to get across is that even when there is a genital kidney present in salamanders, or even when the sperm and the urine can mix in salamanders, 
it's not supposed to. Um, in salamanders, they should not be producing spermic urine as in a lot of frogs they do. In frogs, it's, it's totally normal for them to produce urine with sperm in it. That's not normal for salamanders. Even in the cryptobronchids, they tend to just produce what we call milt, um, just a very dense semen-like substance. Um, now, when you give hormones during ART, we will artificially produce spermic urine because they're peeing at the same time and they're not on their normal cycle. And so you can, in a lot of species, artificially produce spermic urine, and that may affect the quality of your sperm. So, you know, we'll talk about it more during protocols, but that's just something to keep in mind when you get spermic urine in a salamander during ART and sperm collection, the quality may not be what the natural quality is. So one of the main reasons that um, the sperm is typically separate from urine in salamanders is this guy, the spermatophore. So in all of our internal fertilizing salamanders, they should be producing what's called a spermatophore. This is a mechanism for internal fertilization. Um, there's a lot of different ways that this gets into the female, but most ways, and I'll go through some of the, the fun ways that it gets from the male to the female, is that um, the female will come along and pick this up into her cloaca. The spermatophore is a uh, dense, dense packet of sperm with a little gel cap on top. This is a diagram of what a spermatophore looks like. Sometimes it has a gel stalk underneath it, and then it has a gel cap around it, protecting it from the environment. And then there's this big packet of sperm on top. Um, it's designed for endurance in the environment. Uh, some salamanders do undergo amplexus and they'll put it directly into the cloaca, but most of them will just drop these around in the environment and then convince a female to walk over them. So when these spermatophores are in the environment, they may be in poor quality water, they may be just out on, on a stem like we saw in this picture back here that's on a branch. And so because the sperm is out in the environment, it needs to withstand the elements and um, most sperm isn't designed for that. So the spermatophore protects it. There are other animals that use spermatophores. So it's, you know, a, an evolved mechanism and a lot of insects, um, a lot of cephalopods, some gastropods, some nidarians, and even some fish use this me mechanism for internal fertilization. So the salamander sperm, um, it can look a few different ways. Uh, the picture I have here is of tiger salamander sperm. It's got that gigantic kind of sickle shaped head and then a really long tail. Uh, most of them have very long tails. The shapes of the head sometimes are arrow shaped or more pointed. Um, now, when they have spermatophores, a lot of salamanders, when you first see a spermatophore, the sperm may or may not be active. A lot of times it takes touching the egg jelly to actually activate the sperm. It depends on the species. Um, the sperm is usually pretty large, much larger than a urine sperm. Again, that depends on the species, but some species, the sperm is as large as about a half a millimeter long and can be seen with the naked eye. The, the sperm is, is pretty impressive <laughs> to say the least. Um, and a lot of the sperm, because it's in this spermatophore, um, it's, it's densely and the tails are wrapped around each other. Um, I'll talk about how the sperm gets to the egg in a little while, but the sperm doesn't have to move very far because of the internal fertilization. It doesn't swim up the tube to the egg like in a mammal. And um, when it does get contacted, a lot of the times it just swims around in a circle like this. So very atypical movements. Uh, when the sperm actually does hit the egg, it will whip its tail and flagellate like normal sperm. But until it actually hits the egg, sometimes it just spins in a circle uh, and it's, it's fascinating to watch. So um, just this table, again, this is for your reference later, but just to review, highlighted in red are the hormones that help in sperm production. And that's to help you later if you need to reference those hormones. So now let's talk a little about egg laying now that we talked about what the sperm looks like and you know, kind of how it's used. Let, let's just talk about some of the differences in eggs in the different um, species of caught eggs. 
So most caudates are egg-laying, most are oviparous, um, and the eggs can vary quite a bit. Uh, they all have some kind of jelly, and um, typically the jelly, as I mentioned with the sperm, will contact the sperm um, if they're internal fertilizers, the eggs kind of contact the sperm on the way out and that activates the sperm. And then once laid and the eggs contact moisture or water in the environment, they, they form a gel around the egg and this gel can look very different. So, you know, I have on, on the far left there, those are some ambistomatid eggs and salamandrid eggs look very similar either big clumps of eggs or small individual eggs that are, are round with little globs of gel around them. Um, next, I have a um, hynobius sac, and that sac is, is very unique. Um, it looks kind of banana shaped, and the, the gel around it is in, extremely dense. It's almost leather-like. And so um, these, when they lay their, their eggs, their eggs actually come out in this gel. Uh, it's deposited right from their ovary like that. And if you were to try and do in vitro fertilization with these animals, it would be very difficult. Um, you would have to cut the eggs out of the gel and that could potentially damage the eggs. So that, that's something to be very, very cautious and considerate of. Um, and then on the far right, I have a hell vendor. And um, some of you may have a lot of you are probably familiar with the way hellbender eggs look. Um, they have their gel. It's more, I don't know that I would even call it a gel. It's more of a netting um, that connects all the eggs. There's a little canal between all of them. And um, it's, um, it's not very tough, but again, if you, you know, waited till the eggs were laid and, you know, needed to get them out, it would be a big challenge to get them out. Um, so, yeah, well, we'll talk about a bit more about this when we get to IVF. Um, you know, a lot of times people try to squeeze the eggs out before gel is on them um, so that they don't have to, to worry about the eggs blowing up with the gel. But um, yeah, like the case with Hynobius, that, that's not really a possibility. Uh, so there are some life bearing salamanders, um, the no, most notable being fire salamanders, salamander salamandra. It is possible to have them lay eggs, so they're not required to be live bearing. They are technically ovoviviparous, which means they have eggs developing inside them that just hatch inside them, and then they lay um, live larvae. But um, just because it's more natural for them to lay the live larvae, you could have challenges with um, developing these babies if you were to try in vitro fertilization. So uh, here again, just for your reference, these are the hormones highlighted that are, are involved in um, egg development. And I also highlighted some in egg let, let down. Uh, so that was just, you know, gamete development. Now let's talk a bit more about the process of caudate reproduction, which gets a bit more involved. It gets into um, the behaviors and some of the, the pheromone needs of the animals, which is something that I tend to get a bit more concerned about um, because these are the things that, that trigger reproduction and that whole cycle that you know, we mentioned earlier on. So migration is very important in, in most salamanders. Um, you know, I, I can't think of many that don't need to migrate in order uh, to breed. Now, you know, of course we can perform ART without making them migrate, um, but that's just another part of the cycle that we are cutting out and we have to compensate for if we aren't having them migrate. And so that's, you know, something to be considered um, that there are hormones that trigger this migration and we need to consider what hormones we, we need to compensate for without this. Um, the hormonal changes that trigger migration are, are naturally triggered by seasonal change or light change, things like that. Um, you know, even Japanese giant salamanders migrate. Uh, they, you know, tend to migrate back to the, the same area to breed in big groups every year. Uh, courtship is heavily pheromonal driven in, in all species. It's, you know, most notably and recognized in, in plethodons, they have special, um, parts of their body that are adapted for pheromones. And so that, that's something we tend to think of mostly with plethodons, but 
all salamanders use pheromones in their breeding. They use it to know where to migrate to, to sense each other in the environment. Um, and it will help to regulate their hormones during breeding too. Um, a lot of salamanders will, will smell the opposite sex and that increases their uh, GnRH levels and increases their testicular development. So um, pheromones can trigger their entire reproductive cycle. So that being said, it's important in IVF or in vitro fertilization, um, it, it's important to understand that you know, sometimes you, you may need pheromones in order to um, get their cycle moving. Uh, the pheromone cascade triggers are, are still not entirely understood. Um, we know that corticosterone in some species helps increase their, their hormone levels and pheromones. Um, the arginine vasotocin, one of the, the hormones is another one that that triggers pheromone release and is also used as a pheromone. Um, and then prolactin and estrogen and testosterone are thought to be in a lot of species um, helpful in, in triggering pheromones to trigger courtship. Hormones themselves are pheromones and that's something that can be played with in um, assisted reproductive technologies. So um, I have used hormones as pheromones, rubbing them on the salamanders in a, an appropriate location, sometimes on their nose, sometimes on their cloaca, um, because a lot of the males rub their facial parts on the female's cloaca or vice versa. And that will um, tend to trigger either activity or sperm and egg production. So um, again, just for your reference, this highlights which hormones act as pheromones or trigger behavioral effects. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a bit about, you know, we talked about sperm and that, you know, the sperm tends to be a packet of sperm in most of the animals it's, and they are internal fertilizers. Um, the uptake of sperm is, is pretty important, especially if you are going to consider uh, artificial insemination, if you want to actually take that sperm and put it yourself into the female's cloaca. Uh, but even if not, you know, you, you want to consider um, if you are collecting sperm and putting it on the eggs, you should understand how it normally would work. So there's a very important organ in female salamanders called the sperma theca. This is a little pouch off the side of the cloaca that's designed for storing sperm. So when the female walks along and she, she picks up a spermatophore um, that gets tucked into this sperma theca and it gets stored there for a variable amount of time. So, you know, that seems pretty straightforward. Okay, there's a pouch, sperm goes in it, what next? There's a lot of complications with the spermatheca. It's not so simple. We can't, you know, necessarily just pipette a spermatophore into a female cloaca and magic, you know, we, we've done an artificial insemination. Um, there's quite a bit of, first of all, there's quite a bit of variation in how long sperm is stored from species to species. And a lot, we don't know what that length is going to be. Um, we know in some species, the, the length of storage is from spring to summer, usually. We know um, in some species it's from fall to spring, usually. Um, in some species, it can be a few days and they're commonly then washed out. Um, and then in a lot of other species, it's commonly weeks and then they can wash out. Those are the common variations, but then we've also studied in some individuals, they've stored sperm for years. And so it's not a very you know, effective method of artificial insemination if you pipette some sperm in and you don't know if the female's holding on to it for years or if she already washed it out and it was not functional. Um, we also seem to, you know, have found that there's a, a natural environment that the sperm needs inside the spermatheca, inside that cloaca. And we aren't really sure in any species if we're replicating that right. So you would probably need to offer some sort of natural uh, cycling of the animal or hormones in order to get an artificial insemination to work. There are some enzymes that likely trigger the activation of sperm in order to fertilize the eggs and um, probably some, some pH balances and things like that inside the cloaca and that's not fully understood. 
um, in order for appropriate fertilization as well. Um, and these, you know, along with natural cycling and things like that could be successful, but you could also give them artificially. Um, there are three major hormones also, uh, AVT, but easy to remember the P hormones, PGF2 alpha, progesterone, and pro prolactin. And I highlighted those for you here. Uh, but so the actual mechanism of sperm transfer that I've referred to a few times, uh, like I mentioned, typically it involves a female picking up the spermatophore. So this looks a bit different in different species. Uh, plethodons, you know, they're, they're very pheromonally driven. Um, the males have little uh, fang looking organism or organ, organs on their face. Um, they're called nasolabial grooves and they kind of scratch the female with these to drip hormones on her. And then they turn their heads around and whack her with their face um, to, to slap her with those hormones. They also have, I'll, I'll show pictures of these in a minute, a gland on their chin called a mental gland that's just full of pheromones. So they're just dragging pheromones all over these females. Um, and then on the top of their tail, they have um, another pheromonal gland and um, they'll, the female will get her chin all over that gland and the male will do a little dance and get her to follow him over his spermatophore where she picks it up. And then it goes to her spermatheca, fertilization is done. Uh, in a ambistomatid, um, there is also a little bit of dancing, a little bit of pheromone transfer. It's not quite as pheromone sexy as with the plethodons, but um, it, it does involve uh, a little bit of rubbing there. There's no whacking though. Um, so the, the male will um, get real close to the female and entice her with a little tail dance. And then the female will start rubbing her nose on the cloaca of the male. And then um, that gets the male to dance even more. And then as he dances, she follows him up to his spermatophore and picks it up. Now there are some animals that actually undergo amplexus and um, the male will again dance. They really like their dances. I think it's those big tails. Um, will dance for the female. Uh, once she's enticed, he'll grip her really hard and roll her and tuck a spermatophore directly into her cloaca. Um, some of them amplex like this with the back legs. Some of them do with the front legs. It just depends on the species. This is more commonly done in newts. Um, and so if you are doing some um, ART and, you know, you want to make sure you get some good sperm collection, sometimes it helps uh, if they are ones that require some, some nose rubbing from a female on a male cloaca to give them a little encouragement. Look, I'm <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm going to just kind of end with, I feel like I blew through this pretty fast, but I'm going to end with just talking about, you know, if you're going to breed your salamanders, you're going to need to know how to um, tell a male from a female. And so we'll talk about just the, the visual characteristics of, you know, what's a female and what's a female, uh, what's a male and what's a female. Um, cloacal sexing is something, you know, I get asked about a lot. And uh, there are some, some families where it's pretty easy to tell. Um, and so cryptobronchids, when they're in season, um, you can tell a male from a female. The males have a little, little donut um, and the, the females do not. Um, but if they are not in breeding season, it's very difficult to tell. Um, the uh, protidae, so the mud puppies and in theory, the olms, I don't know. I've never seen an olm cloaca. Um, but the, the males have little papilla, and um, especially when in season, those um, papilla, they look like little fingers at the bottom there, um, they get fronds on them, so little feathery bits. Uh, the females don't have that. Um, the salamandridae, they look quite variable, so I'll give you a few examples here. Um, these are echinotriton, um, so the males have swollen looking cloaca, the, the females not so much. Um, here's a Nerargus. Um, so they're in season. Um, the females won't have that, that volcano looking bump if they're not in season um, and the males won't be quite as swollen, but when they're about to breed, um, this is what they would look like. 
And now uh, Amistomatidae, um, the, the males are, are quite bulgy and then the, the females not so much. But um, as, as most animals do when they get older, they may sag a little bit and sometimes an, an older female may, may look a little bit like a male if her pelagus sags a bit. Um, the, the torrent salamanders, the males have a notably square cloaca um, when their, their glands are full, and that's a, an easy way to tell them apart by their cloaca. So non-cloaca visual identifiers, um, just some common themes across the, um, the caudates. Uh, the size difference varies across families, but typically there is some sort of size difference uh, between males and females. Um, the, the more primitive families typically have bigger males. And then as you get more evolved, um, the females tend to be bigger. Um, not always true, but kind of a rule of thumb. Uh, the tail sizes will vary by sex. Uh, males often have longer tails. And then in some families, um, the males will have a tail that gets enlarged or flattened seasonally. And then the head sizes, um, a lot of times the males will have bigger heads. And um, uh, that picture I have there is a Pachyhynobius. He's got a real big lumpy head. Uh, the females have very slender heads and that's a really good example. Um, some other, other visual characteristics that are a little bit more specific. Um, some salamandridae, a lot of the newts, they have these little frondy papilla that come out when they're, when they're getting ready to breed. Um, you have to keep an eye on them because they will come out and then suck back in. But uh, if you're watching them pretty closely, you can see it. And then a lot of newts, um, if they're the amplexing kind, will get nuptial pads. So they'll get these thickened areas on their legs, um, depending on the species. Again, if they're front amplexers or back amplexers, it may be on the front legs, but um, the species it's the back. Uh, some species have dimorphism. Um, some, sometimes this is seasonal. So if they're not ready to breed, they may look the same, but um, it's typically more apparent seasonally regardless. And then these are the uh, plethodon differences I mentioned earlier. So those nasolabial grooves, they look a little bit like a mustache on the male. Um, they're, you know, kind of like little teeth that he'll rake across the female to get those, those pheromones dripping on her and almost injected into her. And then that big, it almost looks like a tumor on his chin um, lump there, that's called a mental gland and that develops in breeding season and that is just full of pheromones um, that he'll use to, to whack the female with and rub all over her. Um, and that's uh, common across most of the plethodon species, the lungless salamanders. Um, and then, you know, when all else fails, ultrasound sexing, which we'll get into during the ultrasound talk. So just um, kind of a plug for it here that you know, in most animals, even the real tiny ones is, is pretty effective, um, but from big to small, ultrasound sexing can be your friend. And then when you get into um, trying to know if an animal is ready to breed or not um, in the bigger males, that's helpful. And then across the females, that's a very, very helpful tool. So I feel like I blew through that pretty fast. Um, I'm very happy to go back to anything if somebody missed something or to answer any questions.